called the heroic age of exploration is of quite a short period of history. It's only just over 20 years at the tail end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And it features people like Captain Scott, Ernest Shackleton, Roald Amundsen. Um, it, great stories, fantastic uh, uh, stories of endurance, tragedy, drama. It's got everything. But interestingly enough, one of the key men in this period of history is this man, Tom Crean. During that period, there were four major British expeditions to the Antarctic in that 20 odd years. And Tom Crean was on three of them. Tom is a central figure in both Captain Scott's expedition, the one on which he died, and on the Shackleton expedition. For example, Tom is one of the last to see Scott alive, a few miles from the South Pole in 1912. A few months later, he goes back to the ice and buries him um, with the Shackleton expedition, when uh, the expedition was in very dire straits, 28 men marooned a thousand miles from anywhere. The rescue operation could not have been a success without Tom Crean. He was an absolute mainstay. Tom could never speak about his exploits. And so he died and he took his story to the grave. And there are very good reasons why he never spoke out about it, which I'll elaborate a bit further. So it is an absolutely compelling and extraordinary story. And the first question you'll be asking yourself is, why haven't I heard about this man before? Hi, it's Chris here from Adventure Breaks. And today I am going to be speaking to Michael Smith, who wrote a book called An Unsung Hero. Uh, which is a book about Tom Crean, one of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, explorers and heroes. Uh, first of all, quick introduction, adventure breaks are adventures, outdoor adventures um, here in the UK. We have weekend and week long events, so you can find out more about those on the link below. So Michael, you wrote a book about Tom Crean. Yes, hello, uh, very nice to be with you all. Um... Uh, some uh, hair raising and uh, quite extraordinary stories that uh, if you were writing a book of fiction people wouldn't believe you um, but it's actually it's all true none of it is made up let me tell you a little bit about this man Tom Crean um, he's at the center stage of this heroic age of exploration and it's, it's worth bearing in mind that by the late uh, 1800s uh, just on the on the cusp of the 20th century, nobody had even stood on the Antarctic continent. It had been mapped from the coast, but nobody had actually been there. And the first exp the first man to record uh, standing on the Antarctic was 1895. In 1901, the British sent the first big expedition down, which was Captain Scott's Discovery Expedition, and Tom Crean was on that. But you need to just what rewind a little bit because this is important to the overall story. He's born in Ireland, out in Kerry, the nicest part of the world, in my view, in this farmhouse. And uh, like most people in West Kerry, very, very poor education, could barely read and write, no jobs. And so he pretty much ran away and joined the Navy as a 16 year old. And um, in 1901, he happened to be in New Zealand. And just as Scott's ship was heading off to the Antarctic for this major expedition, one of Scott's sailors got drunk and absconded and there was a vacancy and Tom Crean volunteered to place, replace him on the, literally on the eve of sailing. And so off they went to the Antarctic to overwinter and it's worth emphasising here, this picture you can see, this ship is actually moored in sea and they were there for two, over two years and eventually they had to use um, dynamite to get out of there to blast apart the ice. Well, Tom Crean proved to be, here he is in the bottom right hand corner with the pipe, proved to be remarkably tough, uh, uh, an agile character who would do anything you threw at him. He was not just a big strong lad but he was dependable. He comes home in 1904 and one of the first people that Scott recruits is Tom Crean. And he goes into the, or back to the Navy, he's in the North Atlantic Fleet, 
And eventually he comes up with another plan to reach the South Pole. And one of the first men he chooses is Tom Crean. And here is Tom Crean in the Antarctic with Scott in 1911. And once again, he's central to these expeditions. It's worth emphasizing that most history, as is the way of things, tends to be written about kings and queens and lords and ladies and prime ministers and presidents. Whereas the ordinary men, as they were called, people like Tom Crean were absolutely central to these expeditions. They not only provided the muscle power, but they were also highly dependable and very versatile characters. If you look at Crean, he's, he's always smiling. This is a, an intriguing photograph. There's, you have to trust me on this. There's 23 people gathered here today. And this is the beginning of Scott's March to the South Pole, October 1911. And of course, five of those men died. It's a, it's a journey of about 1800 miles, 2600 kilometers. And they're going to walk the whole way and the whole way back. Um, a journey of perhaps four months. And if you look at the faces, Scott's in the middle with the lighter coloured coat and the ski stick standing. If you look at all the faces, the men are understandably slightly apprehensive. But look in the bottom right hand corner, the man with his arms folded in the light jacket and pipe. He's the only one smiling. And that's Tom Crean. He was a man who was very sure of his own strengths and weaknesses, um, a, man, a confident man, not a, a braggart, not in any way, uh, but he was confident in his own ability and he provided the muscle. It's interesting that um, Scott took six what he called men with him. Uh, these were petty officers basically from the Navy and three of them were Irish because Tom was a classic of that breed of Irishmen in the late 19th century who, for want of a better life, joined the Navy or the Army. And uh, three of the four men that he, uh, that he centred his expedition around were from Ireland, and Tom was one of them. And you can see the labour that was involved. <clears throat> for those who don't know, the South Pole is about two miles, three kilometres above sea level. And to get there, you've got to climb a mountain. And clearly, you have to take all your supplies with you. And you can see the extraordinary strain that these men are under. And Crean is in that picture in the harness. Um, at times, they were making perhaps two to three miles a day slogging uphill to get to the polar plateau, where they would find two things. One, it was very, very cold and windy. And secondly, they were suffering from altitude sickness. Now, what happens next is part of British history. We know that Captain Scott gets to the South Pole and dies on the way back. Tragic, and it's part of our upbringing. What isn't part of our upbringing and our basic school education is what happened to Tom Crean. So then my understanding is they've set off in teams, what are meant to be teams of well 16 people was it that left yes they began with a group of 16 people and sent back groups of four after depoting supplies of food which could be picked up on the return journey about 150 miles from the south pole in early 1912 scott is left with eight men and he decides to take one of the extra men and make it five and send three back so 150 miles from the pole, he changes his plans entirely and he sends Tom Crean back. Now, Crean was, a, like I mentioned earlier, was a pretty tough character. He was in tears because he wasn't going to the South Pole. But I believe that Captain Scott fully understood what he was doing here. It turns out it was the wrong decision, but nonetheless, he, he made this rational choice and he saw in Tom Crean almost an insurance policy to get the other two men home. And it's important to say who they were. One was a Navy stoker, a very tough character called Bill Lashley. Uh, 
and the other was the officer in charge, Lieutenant Teddy Evans. Evans um, was Scott's deputy and he also expected to go to the pole. He was bitterly disappointed. So 150 miles from the pole, they shake hands, wave goodbye. Scott goes to the pole and subsequently dies along with his comrades. Tom, Bill Lashley and Evans set off for home. Roughly speaking, 750 miles or give or take 1100 kilometers. And before we get into the Tom Crean return journey, so the three men that are returning, could you just give us a minute on what happens to Scott? Yes, yeah, Scott leaves uh, Tom, Evans and Lashley about 150 miles or so from the pole, reaches the pole on the 17th of March, where he discovers that Roald Amundsen, the great Norwegian explorer, has beaten him to the prize by about a month. When Scott had originally set sail from the UK to head to the South Pole, he didn't realise he was going to be in a race, did he? Nobody knew that he was going to be in a race because Amundsen didn't tell anybody until they were too late. They were out of reach of, of the telegraph, as it was in those days. And so he, he turned up um, in the Antarctic without pretty much without telling anybody. He did send Scott a telegram by which time it was too late to change the plans. Um, so, yeah, he, he went behind their back, but he was the supreme professional. Um, he didn't let things like science get in the way. It was pure geographical discovery. So we've got a scenario here where, as you say, Scott was sending Tom Crean and two others back, so three men back. These five have gone on. They've got to the South Pole and found out that they'd been beaten in what, what turned out to be a race to the pole between Scott's party, the British party, and Roald Amundsen, and they'd been beaten. And then, so Scott turns around from the pole, utterly devastated, I imagine. Completely devastated. And of course, the journey turns into a nightmare. First, you have the loss of uh, Taffy Evans, the big man on the right, and then you lose Captain Oates, the white star who's standing on the left of your picture. <coughs> and they reached a spot within 11 miles of safety before Scott, Wilson and Bowers all died in March 1912. <coughs> now that story, <coughs> excuse me, that story of course forms part of uh, British history. Many people are familiar with it and would certainly understand Scott. He was an incredibly brave and courageous man. There's no question about that. But what happened next to Tom Crean was completely eclipsed by the tragedy of Scott. Like I said, he parts from Scott around about 150 miles from the pole and turns around with his leader, Evans, the, the, the lieutenant, and Bill Lashley, the Navy man. And they head off and they walk across the polar plateau and the only way they can survive is by picking up the food depots they've left on the way up. At one point they get lost at the top of the glacier which they have to go down to get to the bottom. They can't go back because there's no food backwards and they have to go forward to find the depot but time is running out. The food bag is empty and so they improvise in the most extraordinary way. The three men sit on a sledge and almost toboggan their way downhill without knowing whether they're going to hit a crevice, a glacier, a, a rock, go over the edge, anything could happen. And they, we know that they glissaded down this uh, icy slope, we don't know how far, and they luckily came to a halt in, a, in a, a build up of snow and they were all right. And sure enough, they then found the food depot. If they hadn't, they would have died. They then carried on marching and to their horror, they reached what is effectively the Ross Sea, which is a, an ice cap, a polar ice shelf. It's about 400 miles long, 600 kilometers long. It's flat as being at sea. By the time they got there, Evans, the boss, has got scurvy and is going downhill rapidly. The important thing about this to note is that Evans is the only one who can navigate. So they're 
in effect at sea without a navigator. They pull on. Evans then collapses. And he calls Tom Crean and Bill Lashley into the tent in a very weakened state, lapsing in and out of consciousness. And he orders them to leave him behind and save themselves. They refuse. They do no more than pack up and put him on the sledge and carry him as well. By this stage, they're down to four or five miles a day, incredibly weak. It's hard to know precisely how much they were eating, but we would guess at less than half the calorie intake they needed. Um, they would, would be in a terrible state. And also most polar explorers of this age, interestingly enough, uh, were totally dehydrated because they never drank enough. Because to make a drink, drinking snow is not good for you. It just in increases the, the cold of your, your body heat. Um, to make a drink, a hot drink, you have to stop, pitch the tent, light the stove, boil the ice, make tea. It took too long, so they didn't drink. They were always gasping for, for drink. They marched on and on, Evans lapsing in and out of consciousness, and eventually they camped around about 35 miles, 56 kilometers from the safety of the hut. Evans was now semi-comatose, Bill Lashley was played out, and Crean was the only one still standing. And so he asks Bill Lashley to stay with Evans in the tent and he will go on alone for the last 35 miles to fetch help. Now, he had no tent, no sleeping bag, no stove to make a hot drink, and the only food he had was a couple of biscuits and some sticks of chocolate. And you have to stop and think here for a second. He's already marched, roughly speaking, 1500 miles. And from where Chris is talking to me now, 1500 miles would get you to Moscow. He's already walked that far. And now he's going to walk another 35 miles alone without any support across very, very badly broken surface, full of crevices. And he sets off. Now, we don't know very much about what happened next because Tom never spoke to anybody about it, which I'll come to in a second. But at one point, we know that he stopped, as he put it, to have his rations, his sticks of chocolate and biscuits. Um, and he sat on a, on a lump of ice, grabbed a handful of ice to slake his thirst and began to eat his uh, sticks of chocolate and his two biscuits. And then he had second thoughts. He took his last biscuit and he was just about to bite into it and he put it in his pocket as he put it for emergencies. And you wonder what more could go possibly go wrong, you know, a meteor strike perhaps. Um, and that rather sums up Tom Crean to me, because what he was saying was that I intend to survive. I'm going to get through this and I might need that last biscuit to sustain me over the last few miles. Well, the upshot of it was that he walked pretty much nonstop for 18 hours and he stumbled into the hut where he discovered by sheer chance that the only doctor for 400 miles happened to be in the hut that day. And the doctor gave him a tot of brandy as doctors did in those days to revive him. And he was probably sick all over the poor old doctor. And then do you know what he did? He volunteered to go back out on the ice and rescue Evans and Lashley who were still out in the tent. Luckily the doctor knew better, sent him off to bed with a bowl of hot porridge and went off and rescued Evans and Lashley. And Evans lived by the skin of his teeth. And in fact, he lived to be an admiral in the British Navy. And uh, he survived because of Tom Crean's great courage. But of course, the appalling state of Crean, Lashley and Evans only increased the anxiety for Scott. The people at the hut waited for them to come in. They spent hours looking at the horizon. 
see if they could see on the white landscape the distant dark shapes of these five men coming home. Of course, they never came. And so they then had to sit out the winter. And here's Tom Crean after his march. Doesn't look too bad a condition, but they sat out the winter. And it, in October 1912, which is the spring in the Antarctic, they set out to find Scott's body. And here's Tom now looking much more robust. And they discovered Scott's body around about 11 miles from safety of a large food depot. So when he's seven, sorry, 11 miles from safety, how far back has he marched from the pole then? Is he about, he's, he's, he's almost, um, he will have done over 600 miles um, at this point. So he was about, about, uh, about 650 miles from the pole. He, he was about 150 miles, 180 miles from safety. Yeah. But what, in, what happens next is quite intriguing for historians like me, is that um, they went into the tent and found three bodies. Oates and Evans had died elsewhere and their bodies were never found. The three men were still in their sleeping bags. They took their personal effects, such as their diaries and their letters to their wives and things like that. They took them out. And then the idea was that they would collapse the tent and build a cairn of snow and use a pair of skis as a cross, as you can see, this is what happened. Tom Crean did something very personal and actually very Irish in, in the next moment. Before they collapsed the tent, he went back into the, into the tent and he kissed Scott's forehead. This is a very, if there are any Irish people watching, listening, Oh, no, this is something which people do to corpses in Ireland, where you have the open coughing. It's fairly common for people to kiss a corpse goodbye. And that's what Tom was doing. And so they then collapsed the tent, built the cairn of snow and went home. And Tom came back to the Navy. And after that dramatic episode, he was awarded the Albert Medal, which is the equivalent of the George Cross for saving the lives of Evans and Lashley. And you might think <laughs> that would be enough polar exploration for one life. Within a matter of months, here is Tom with Evans and Lashley, the men whose lives he saved. That's Tom on the right, looking scruffy. The two others are uh, much, much better dressed. Um, and uh, within months of coming back, he joined Shackleton and went back to the Antarctic for the dramatic endurance expedition. And this photograph, Shackleton is in is at the back standing up with a smile. And right next to him, to the right of the picture, is Tom Crean. So and that's uh, incredible. He's Tom Crean has survived coming back from 150 miles away from the pole, roughly. Yeah. Made it all the way back and saved two men already, Lashley and Evans. He's then recovered and in the springtime in the Antarctic, he's gone out and effectively discovered Scott's body, which was about 150 miles from, from their base camp. From yeah. and, and you mentioned he kissed Scott on the head when he found the body yeah. before they collapsed the tent. That was, am I right in thinking no one knew that until you started doing your research? But no, that wasn't known. And I mean, I, I can tell you that um, I know the Scott family. And um, I was giving a lecture once and one of the Scott family was there and he hadn't heard that story. And he came up to me afterwards and said, I was in tears when you told me that because I'd never heard it before. Um, and so Tom uh, uh, effectively buries Scott, comes home, dusts the snow off himself and then turns around and goes back to the Antarctic with Shackleton. Shackleton's plan was, was wildly ambitious. His aim was to walk across the Antarctic continent from coast to coast. Half of that journey uh, from the Weddell Sea to the South Pole was completely unknown territory. Um, the other half had been done because we know Scott and Amundsen had been to the South Pole and they knew the way back to the Ross Sea. 
this was a very, very ambitious project. And I have to say, I'm amongst those who believe that they might not have made it had they landed. It turns out that that was never tested because the ship was crushed. This is 1914 at the outbreak of the First World War. They take their ship into the Waddell Sea, which is the bit of Antarctica, which is due south from South America. And the ship is immediately trapped. Within a month of entering the ice, it's trapped. And the men lived, they, up, they abandoned the ship, moved all their supplies and equipment uh, onto the ice and lived on a piece of ice for uh, 16 months. Now, it's, in, it's worth saying that when you say lived on the ice, it almost sounds as though it's just a frozen landscape. They were in the middle of an ocean. The ice was moving. And from the moment the ship was trapped until the moment they left the ice, the men, 28 of them, including Tom Crane here with his dogs, they drifted for 2,000 miles, 3,000 kilometres roughly, big semicircle around the Weddell Sea. They tried to walk as best they could to open sea, but they, this was a hopeless task. They, they, the, the boats were too heavy. They weighed a ton each. They couldn't, you can see the extraordinary strain that the men are under trying to pull their boats to water. It was hundreds of miles to open water. Um, and that was a futile exercise. Trying to imagine that. Uh, they've got no radio contact. No one is expecting them back. They're, they're almost sort of the equivalent of being lost in space. Considerably worse than being lost in space. Um, for, for a start, they were anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 miles from civilization. They had no radio and nobody was coming to get them. Uh, they, they, they'd only given a vague outline of where they were going and any other ship that went into those waters would have also been trapped. So there was, the prospect of rescue was pretty much zero. This photo shows one of the boats, is it? This, so this is effectively a lifeboat, really, from the main ship. Yeah, the, this one still exists. It's, it's about 22 and a half feet, so sort of seven metres long. Um, and uh, this is the James Caird, uh, which is still in, in Dulwich College in London today. They knew at some point they were going to have to put the boats in, in the water. And the water, of course, is full of icebergs and breaking, appalling weather. The men were reasonably well fed, it's fair to say. They weren't starving, unlike Scott. They were eating seals and penguins. And of course they had rations, which they'd intended to use for the crossing of the continent. They, they reached a point um, at the, towards the end of uh, March, April, 1915, when, uh, sorry, 1916, uh, when, the ice was beginning to break up and Shackleton ordered the three boats into the water, 28 men and supplies. Initially, they were going to make for one of the uninhabited islands at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, which is roughly where they were. But that was against the currents, very, very difficult to do. And so they changed course a few times, but ultimately they headed to a place called Elephant Island which is just a dot of rock in this vast ocean, the vast Southern Ocean. It's about seven or eight miles long. Um, and it's just a hugely uh, hostile place. Very, very windy. You can see an image of it here. Now, many of the men were in very, very bad shape. It's fair to say Tom Cream wasn't one of them. Of the 28 men, Shackleton wrote in his diary that 10 of them were off their heads. Now by that, he means really the psychological effects of the isolation, the uncertainty of knowing whether they were going to get out. And also the fact that nobody was coming for them. Nobody knew they were on Elephant Island. They had no radio to signal for help. And Elephant Island is not on the shipping routes. There were no ships passing by. You couldn't light a fire and wave at people as they went by, that was not possible. And so Shackleton decided that he would take the largest of the boats, which is this one here as James Caird, and go to the nearest place where they knew 
there were habitants, which is the island of South Georgia, roughly speaking, 800 miles away, 1200 kilometers. Not in a direct line, however, because they had to take account of the currents. He would take with him a total of six men, leave 22 on the beach at Elephant Island to make do as best they could. And Tom Crean literally begged to go with Shackleton. He wanted to take his chances with the sea. He was a man of the sea. He wanted to take his chances with the sea. He didn't want to be left on the island to an uncertain fate. The chances of getting through were tiny. Luckily, they had with them a peerless navigator, Frank Worsley, a New Zealander, who was a man brought up at the, on the sea. They sailed for 17 days in this open boat. One cannot imagine the horrors they went through. They struck several hurricanes um, and how they survived is almost beyond belief. But Worsley's navigation was absolutely flawless. And they found South Georgia, which itself is quite a small island, it's only 100 miles long, and it's in the middle of nowhere in the Southern Ocean. If they'd missed it, they'd have been out in the South Atlantic and would almost certainly have perished. It'd be very difficult to turn back. It's, it's incredible, isn't it? It's really, again, hard to almost be able to sort of conceive or, or put context to that. So, so they've been trapped in the ice, lost, lost their ship, crossed the ice to open ocean with these three small boats, open top boats. And then, and how far was the crossing to Elephant Island first? Elephant Island took seven days to reach. Yeah. That was an appalling journey of very, very cold weather, brutal winds, and they weren't able to cook hot meals. So they were eating cold dog food in effect. Yeah, a very, very, um, very, very harrowing journey. But interestingly enough, once again, when you, when you look at all the diary, the inscriptions, Tom Crean is one of the few men still standing. Yeah, he wasn't one of the ten who was off their heads. When they got to South Georgia, the little boat that they'd sailed in, the James Caird, had suffered the loss of. Uh, its rudder on the way into the beach. Now this is important because they landed on the south side of the island and the, the whaling ships of South Georgia were moored on the north side. Without a rudder, the ship, the little boat was going nowhere. And three of the men were in a fairly bad way. Not Tom Crean, Frank Worsley and Ernest Shackleton. So they decided to cross the island walk across the island, leave the three men with the boat and cross South Georgia. Difficult to be precise, but it's a brutally uh, cold place, very high winds, weather changes uh, in an instant in South Georgia. In terms of height, you're looking at mountain, average mountain ranges of 6,000 feet, so sort of 2,000 meters or so. Um, uh, that's the average. And that's sort of what, double the height of Ben Nevis then, the tallest mountain in, in Britain? Yeah. Uh, but also, one needs to bear in mind, this is midwinter. Midwinter in May. 1916, which is the equivalent of November in, in the Northern Hemisphere. But now we come to a really crucial decision. Shackleton decided they would travel light. The waiting station was about 40 miles away. And I say about because nobody had a map. In fact, there were no maps. Nobody had ever been through the interior of South Georgia before. It was completely unexplored. So they were really going on dead reckoning and from memory. He decided no tent, no sleeping bag to save weight. So all they had was a bit of food which they wrapped in socks and put round their necks, not for any other reason other than to keep it warm, which meant that it wouldn't freeze and be inedible. So they set off, the three of them, to walk across these mountains. And they had no equipment beyond a bit of rope and, and an ice axe. And uh, 
they knew they had to roughly the direction they were going, but that's all. And at one point, there's almost a, a, a reprieve of what Tom Crean had done with Lashley and Evans a few years earlier with Scott's expedition. Um, they got to the top of one of those mountain ranges. And as they looked down, it was a sheer drop, a precipice. It meant they couldn't go on, they had to go back. As they turned to go back, they suddenly realised that it was getting dark. And with darkness on South Georgia, the temperatures dropped like a stone. You might hit minus 30, minus 40. They would be up five, 6,000 feet, 2,000 metres or so. Um, they would freeze to death without a tent or sleeping bags. And so it was decided they would have to get down very quickly, otherwise they would perish. But how do you get down quickly? Without, certainly without any equipment and without a sledge. So they improvised brilliantly. We don't know whose idea this was. It might have even been Tom Crean's. The only bit of equipment apart from the ice axe they had was about 15 meters length of rope. And they twirled the rope into three mats, if you can imagine, rather like a placemat for a cup. And then the three men sat on the mats and put their arms and legs each other round each other like a toboggan team and kicked off downhill. <coughs> and they had no idea where they were going. And I mean, literally no idea. They might have been going into the sea for all they knew. They went downhill rapidly. Um, they didn't hit any boulders. They didn't go into a crevice, thank goodness. And when they arrived at the bottom, the only thing that they were concerned about was that one of them had torn their trousers. And Frank Worsley was worried in, in that quaint way that people did in those days, was worried that there might be some women at the whaling station. And what would they say if they saw a man walking towards them with torn trousers? Well, bizarrely enough, Tom Crean came to his rescue. He had a couple of safety pins and he gave them to Frank Worsley to pin up his trousers. And so they marched on and after 36 hours, so a day and a half, without a break, without sleep, and with, they did have some food, hot food as well, which was a great help. They finally reached the whaling station. And as they shuffled along the quayside, the first people to encounter them were two little boys who were playing football. And they fled because they thought these men were scarecrows or ghosts coming from the, because nobody came from the interior of South Georgia. The whole focus of South Georgia was seaward. So to see people coming from the interior was um, extremely rare. So no one had ever crossed South Georgia before? None at all. None at all. <coughs> they literally they stumbled into the whaling station. I mean, they would have been... They won't have had a wash for over a year. They were certainly underfed. They weren't totally malnourished. They were underfed. Their faces would have been black with the uh, fuel from the seal stove. They cooked seal blubber, cooked on seal blubber, and the fumes and the smoke it gave off left them with blackened faces. Um, uh, their hair would have been unkempt, to say the least, and they would doubtless have needed a good shave. Um, so they regrouped and the first question they asked, this was May 1916, the first question they asked the whaling station manager was, is the war over? Because they left Britain in August 1914 and they were quite possibly the only people in the civilised world who didn't know what was going on. They'd missed a great chunk of the First World War. The Battle of the Somme was a matter of weeks away. So they were absolutely stunned when they were told um, what had been going on. <clears throat> they rescued the three lads who were left with the boat on the other side of the island. And then they set about going back to Elephant Island to rescue the 22 men who were still there. Sadly, that took four and a half months. They made four attempts before they were finally successful. Because, like I said, it was midwinter and the ice wouldn't let them in, basically. They eventually reached South Georgia, uh, Elephant Island, where the men were living in appalling conditions. 
living off seals and penguins, anything they could find. And on August the 30th, 1916, they arrived and took them off and brought them back to South America. <coughs> and um, Tom Crean is standing on the left of the photograph about three, he's sixth from the left. One of the few who doesn't need a shave. Um, and this is an historic photograph because it's the last image we have of Tom Crean as an explorer. Because believe it or not, this is September 1916. They had a few drinks and I think you'd all agree they probably deserved a few pints. They had a few drinks and then nearly all those men got on a boat and came back to the UK and went straight into the war. And some were killed, some were wounded. Tom Crean, as it happens, was stationed in Ireland by chance because he was in the North Atlantic fleet and there was a, there was a base in Ireland, actually not very far from his home in Kerry. And whilst he was there, he married this lady who was a neighbour in the village of Alnascore in Kerry. And before anybody asks, I have no idea why he's sitting and she's standing. Um, and he lived there. He served in the Navy until 1920. So he served in total for 27 years and he came home in 1920. And what happens next is the reason why very, very few people know about the Tom Crean story. Because he came home during the Irish War of Independence. And here he is with two of his children. One died when she was very young and the, uh, the taller of the two girls, the one on the left, is Mary. And she died not very long ago and she was 99 and a half. So she was obviously made from the same tough stuff as her dad. But Tom Crean came back to Ireland in March 1920. It was extremely dangerous time to be in Ireland, to say the least. The War of Independence was raging. Um, Ireland was pretty much at full at war with the British uh, people, British Army. What we would today call the IRA, but the forces, the Irish forces, in effect, said that anybody associated with the British was a target. So that would not, in, not only include soldiers, obviously, would be a target, but it would be people like policemen, Coast Guard officers, anyone who worked primarily for the Crown. And this is the reason why Tom Crean never spoke to anybody about his exploits. He never gave a single interview. He didn't write a book. He didn't write letters and he never ever spoke. He didn't even speak to his family because I interviewed the family and asked them. What happened next is doubly tragic because in April 1920, a, a, literally a few weeks after he came home, his brother, who was a policeman, was ambushed and shot dead. And so he buried his eldest brother and vowed that the man who had survived the Antarctic three times vowed that the way to survive rebellion in Ireland was to keep his head down. And so he chose deliberately not to speak about his exploits. So he never spoke about being in the ice with Scott and Shackleton or anything else. He just became another Irish citizen. He would have been uh, living in Kerry, fiercely nationalist place. Um, he would have been an Irish speaker and the family would have been almost certainly Republican uh, by nature. We don't know for sure whether they were active. We doubt it. But anyway, Tom chose to keep his head down and he did that. Sometime around about it, when he came home, he bought this place, which was an old forge. And over the next few years, he turned it into a pub. And he turned it into a pub, which is still there to this day. And this is it. It's right by the river in, in Aldersgall in Kerry. And the only concession that Tom Crean made to his time of Antarctic exploration was the name of the pub. It's called the South Pole Inn. In Ireland, those of you who know Ireland will probably realise that 
most pubs, not so much in city centres, but certainly rural pubs in Ireland, are invariably named after the owner or the family. So in Irish tradition, this pub would have been called Crean's. But he called it the South Pole Inn because he clearly wanted people to know that he had, in fact, had some connection. But people used to go to the pub to talk to Tom Crean, the man who'd been with Scott and Shackleton, the famous Irish explorer. And he would, if you excuse the pun, he would simply melt away. He never spoke to a soul. And I interviewed his daughters when they were alive. And they said to me, both of them said, he never spoke to us about his exploits. So in 1938, here he is actually not far off this time. We don't know for sure the, the date of this, but he looks to me around about 60. The interesting thing, this is the last known photograph of Tom Green. He's still smiling. And a few months later, after this photograph was taken, something tragically sad, possibly fitting, but certainly sad, happened. Tom developed appendicitis, but there was no surgeon available and he was transferred to the nearest hospital, which was Cork, around about 120 kilometers from where he lives. Very rural island, this is. And uh, by the time he'd got there, he septicemia had set in and he died. And so the man who'd survived three expeditions, saved people's lives, the last to see Scott alive, was an absolute stalwart for Shackleton on the endurance expedition and survived the Irish War of Independence and the Irish Civil War. He was killed by what is today a relatively straightforward complaint, not a pleasant complaint, it's fair to say, but a fairly straightforward complaint. And so he was buried in Alnascore, not far from the pub. And uh, he quite literally, this is not a, a metaphor, he quite literally took his story to the grave. And it wasn't until I wrote a book about him that he became a well-known figure. And the book has been, it was very, very popular. Um, it um, became number one bestseller in Ireland. People knew nothing about this man, suddenly they did. The book has subsequently been translated into Chinese, Korean, not by me, I might add, German, Italian. Um, it's a very successful stage play. Uh, a statue's been put up to him and there are various other spin-offs. And more important for me, the most um, uh, gratifying thing is that for the first time ever, the story of Tom Crean is now being taught to children in Ireland because the subject of my book is on the school's curriculum in Ireland. And so every child now knows the story of Tom Crean. It is a genuinely remarkable story. Um, and I've only just skated over it, but yeah, I've been captured all in my book, An Unsung Hero. Um, it is an incredible story. You couldn't make it up. So um, that's really just all I wanted to say about Tom. If you have any questions, Chris, let me know and I'll, I'll take the pictures off the screen. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you, Michael. And yeah, thank you for, for sharing the story and for sharing Tom's story. Um, as you say, I guess he didn't really have a voice due to the political situation at the time. Um, and so you started your research 1997, was it? Around about that time, yeah. Yeah. And, and when did the book come out? In 2000. Strangely enough, I couldn't find a publisher. Nobody was interested. They thought it wasn't a very interesting story. And do you think that's just a little bit chicken and egg in terms of no one knew who he was because the story hadn't been told? There's always an element of that. It's it's terribly fashionable for authors to say they've had trouble getting their, their books published. I mean, Joanne Rowling is the is is the best example I can think of. Um, not that I'm comparing myself to Joe Rowling, um, uh, but um, you know we've all had trouble getting. But I took two three years before any publisher was interested in the story, and the, the, a lot of them said, "Oh, it's just another story about Scott and Shackleton." Well, actually, it isn't. I don't think. I think it's much, much better than that. And it's also, uh, for me, I mentioned earlier that one of the things that motivated me to write the story is that I love history. I've always loved history. 
but it is invariably written about kings and queens and lords and ladies and generals and admirals. And I wanted to tell the story of Antarctic exploration through the eyes of this ordinary man, Tom Crean. And I hope I've done that. I mean, certainly the book has been very popular. It sold over 100,000 copies. And so the, I must be doing something right. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, I've got copies here. We'll put links below to these, but this is uh, your book, An Unsung Hero. And then this is the, the version, which, is, as you say, is now on the curriculum in schools, isn't it? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. That's really interesting. And yeah, it gives us a bit of a flavour for, for Tom Crean and the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. So we'll yeah. below. And thank you very much for speaking to us today. No problem at all.